Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. You are now listening to Season 7 of the show. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by the wonderful Christina Blacklaws. Christina studied jurisprudence at the University of Oxford, qualifying as a solicitor in 1991 and specialising in family law. Christina has experience as a business development partner at TV Edwards LLP, Director of Policy at the Cooperative Legal Services, and Director of Innovation at Crips LLP. She served as the President of the Law Society of England and Wales from July 2018 to 2019. Christina is passionate about diversity, inclusion, mental health, access to justice, and technology. Christina is the Head of Faculty at the Legal Technology and Innovation Institute and is the Chair of Law Tech UK. Christina is also the proud founder of Black Laws Consulting, a consultancy based all around technology, innovation, diversity, and inclusion support. Christina has been awarded Modern Lawyer of the Year 2014, the Power Woman Award 2018, and International Lifetime Achievement Award in 2020, and she was also nominated for the United Nations Women of Distinction Award 2019, and in 2023, Christina was awarded an honorary fellowship from Exeter College, Oxford. So with that in mind, a very big warm welcome, Christina. Hi, Rob. I am really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Ah, well, we're more excited to have you on the show. And before we dive into all your amazing projects, experiences, and everything you've been doing for the legal community, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is, on the scale of one to 10, 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality of the law if you've seen it? Oh my God, Rob, I have, uh, this is a terrible admission. I've never seen it. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to sit in the fence or go for a zero because I just don't know. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. I would say it's probably about 60% of our guests have seen it, 47% haven't. So I think a zero is very fair. And with that, we should move swiftly on to talk a bit all, <laughs> all about you, not mean at all. So Christina, would you mind telling our listeners a bit about your background and career journey? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I was a tiny bit precocious because I really decided I want to be a lawyer since I was like a a young teenager. I I sort of got early on how important the law is and how it can change people's lives for good or for ill, you know, and, and without it, how, you know, society just can't function. So, so I really probably about 12 I really thought I wanted to be a lawyer Um, so I did jurisprudence at university and and then went on to qualify as a solicitor you know and 30 years later um, I don't think I have any regrets about it I I kicked off as a a solicitor who was specializing in representing children in public law proceedings so you know when when the state gets involved because children have been abused or or neglected or there is a worry about that, Uh, then the child has their own lawyer. And and that was me. And I did that for for many, many years and, and absolutely heart and soul loved it. It was about all the things that are important to me, you know, about vulnerable children, about access to justice, about making things better that was the whole role of the court process and my my role in it was to to make sure that that child was in a better place at the end of the process than than they were at the beginning so you know really um for me highly motivating work and at the same time i was um building up my businesses um so you know that that was that was also important to me i, I guess i I think of myself as a, an entrepreneur in in the in, in the legal industry. So um, so I built up a very large, um, primarily family, um, but also social welfare business, uh, and that's when technology started to to come into my life in the early two thousands, where I set up um, what I think was one of the very first virtual law firms, um, and and that enabled. Uh, people up and down the country to work 
through the technology that we had created, that's when I learned to code, um, and, uh, and um, you, you know, enabled them to work in ways that flexible, agile ways that that worked for them and and for us, and was you know, good for the client and regulatory compliance. So yeah, that that was that was the sort of first, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I guess, fifteen to twenty years of my career in a nutshell. Well, yeah, and it's a wonderful career. And there's so many things we're going to dive into from sort of entrepreneurship to technology to your core values. And, you know, you do so much um, for the legal community. Um, I'm going to be amazed how we're going to manage to pack this all into to one episode. Um, but let's talk a little bit sort of prior to the sort of entrepreneurial world, because you did very well within organizations as well. You were director of policy at the Cooperative Legal Services. And again, a first, I believe, establishing the UK's first alternative business structure. So would you mind explaining the role of sort of development of that business structure and, and what you got up to there? Yeah, sure. So um, when the law changed, which enabled non-lawyers to own and manage legal businesses, I, I thought there was a real opportunity here. So I, um, I built a business case uh, around children and family law contacted the the, the co-op um, and um, you know blow me down <laughs> they thought it was a good idea too um, so uh, so I joined um, I so I joined the co-op um, I, I um, put my firm with a with a friendly firm so that everybody was you know able to carry on doing what they were doing but I, I thought you know it's one of these leap, leaps of faith things I thought gosh this is a real opportunity to do something that will make a, 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 a difference to people across the country um, so with the colleagues at the co-op we built the first alternative business structure so so in fact we, we did get the very first license from the SRA to be able to um, uh, operate an, an alternative business structure um, and you know it was great at the height of um, the work that we did at the co-op we were helping about 300,000 people a year with their with their legal problems their legal issues and because the co-op was a social is a social purpose business um, really that was you know that was really important for the organization as well that what we were doing was was helping vulnerable we, we had the largest legal aid contract by by a country mile um in in england and wales um helping you know vulnerable and ordinary people to access justice to be able to address their legal needs and and we built it because it was a wonderful opportunity we had a blank piece of paper so so what we built was sort of modular fixed price remotely delivered and again that's where technology came came in as as well um services um and you know that as i say that 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 worked that did work very well for a lot of people yeah and it's again it's a, it's a great sort of you know trailblazing moment within your your career and i guess if we fast forward to uh, july 2018 i believe you were the first elected president of the law society and i know you also may be aware we've had i stephanie boyce come on the show love the shoot you come on the show we have also done amazing things but can you tell us about your why and what motivated you to apply for the role of president yeah, sure. So um, I've been a council member of the Law Society since 2002. And I had sat on and then chaired an, a number of committees and then boards within the Law Society. And, uh, you know, I thought, and I'm going to throw my hat, hat in the ring to become an office holder. It's like a three year thing. You, you, you get elected to the role of deputy vice president and then on to vice president and president, you know, unless you do something terrible, which uh, <laughs> luckily I, I managed to avoid. And what really, you know, the thing that really motivated me was it was again, and it's, it's the you know, consistent theme throughout my career was I just really thought it was an amazing opportunity to make a difference so I was quite strategic I guess about my office holder and presidential time so um, from the minute that I was elected I established really the themes that uh, I wanted to take through because I knew you know I couldn't do very much in one year as president but actually if I had three years with the support 
of um, the wonderful people at the Law Society. Um, if we had three years, we could do some pretty amazing things. And, you know, and that, uh, and that, and, and also, you know, it, it's not just about doing important things for society. It was also about my profession, which, you know, which I, I, I love to, to my core. So, you know, that, that was, and, and making sure that uh, the solicitor's profession, uh, particularly on the international stage, was continued to be held in, in really high respect, I think was also something that motivated me. Yeah, and you're you're absolutely motivated, that's for sure. And that's just a testament to everything that's, you know, behind your your career and your your accolades that we we mentioned earlier on. But take us to that time. You know, what did a typical day look like for you as the president of the Law Society of England and Wales? You know, it's maybe some general responsibilities. Yeah, give us a day in the life back then. Yeah, sure. So um <laughs> long days. <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky. Uh, to complete my presidential time prior to COVID. So involved a lot of traveling as, as well. In fact, I, in my presidential year, I think I visited 30 countries in, in the 52 weeks. So it was, <laughs> I was often on a train, on a plane, um, you know, tra- tra- traveling to get to places. Um, but be- because of the, um, the sort of major, uh, three major themes of my time as an office holder and president um, around technology and innovation, around access to justice, but also women in leadership and law. And, and because that program, because of that program, actually, I probably traveled a lot more than um, many other presidents, because it was a truly international program to, first of all, understand why women were not getting to positions of authority and leadership within the legal profession, uh, and to understand that globally, and then to work out the barriers, uh, not the barriers, to address the barriers, um, and then to, to, to move on to activism, to enable people um, really across the world to be able to be a you know, positive force for change themselves. So we, we, uh, we did the largest ever survey, a uh, global survey, uh, which gave us a heap of information. Um, we prepared toolkits for the qualitative part of our research, which was undertaken by way of round tables. So, so I was very fortunate. I, I uh, facilitated 50 round tables in 19 different countries. So I had a personal yeah, amazing, amazing experience. And, and from that, we, ex- we, we produced three reports. And at the end of the, the whole process, an international symposium and a women in law uh, pledge, which was supported by all the representative bodies and the UK government, and that the pledge sort of distilled everything <laughs> that, we, that we had learned along that sort of three-year three year journey. Um, and so, so that uh, gave me, uh, it gave shape, I think, to to my time as 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 president. Um, no, 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 no one day was the same as 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 another, and each one was entirely packed. So, if it's only the UK, um, I would probably be speaking at you know three or four events in a day, literally running from one thing to another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like you say, pre-pandemic, you know, there was you you were mobile, you were everywhere. So you had the travel on top of the preparation, on top of everything else staying away. You know, it's it, it was full on, right? It was it was completely full on. Um and absolutely wonderful to do. But you know, by the time it was it came to an end, I was crawling, you know, trying to <laughs> <laughs> it, it was exhausting it was absolutely exhausting but you know a wonderful a, you know wonderful time I'm so I'm so grateful for the opportunity to to have done that 
and you absolutely took it with both hands and, and, and made some astronomical steps forward for the profession, it has to be said. And you know what you're referencing then was one of the most comprehensive pieces of research that you uh, conducted and, and spearheaded. But you know, you are a sucker for punishment because at the time you also chaired the Policy and Technology Commission looking at the use of algorithms in the criminal justice system, which I can imagine was rather interesting. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that, that was a fabulous project, actually, you know, and many thanks again to the, the wonderful people at the Law Society to, to really lean into it and support it. So what we were, what we wanted to do, and it was a proper commission, so we've held evidence sessions where, which were live and open to the public, and, and I chaired, I chaired those evidence sessions, but we also had, I think, about 75 five written submissions to the commission from different bodies and organizations and we also did a lot of sort of academic research around it as well and you know what we found was that algorithms were being used in the criminal justice system I'm not going to quite say willy-nilly but (laughs) without (laughs) much um, or or, or the necessary thought around how those algorithms were developed, by whom, for what purposes, what, you know, whether there was any bias that was um, implicit in the way the algorithms were working, and without the, the police forces really having the understanding of, of the context within which they were using these algorithms. And they were using them for things, obviously facial recognition is, is one thing we're all aware of, but they were also using them to determine, you know, uh, post-sentencing issues. So, you know, who got to um, go on a course, who got to be considered for parole. You know, all of these things were, all these really important things were being, the decisions were being made by algorithms and that seemed to us to be pretty worrying. <laughs> so, so we made a whole heap of recommendations about what needed to, to be undertaken at that time. And indeed, um, some police forces stopped using some of their systems as, as a result of this because they, I think, recognised the risks and the dangers that um, that, that type of policing involved so so you know and I, and I think government took it very seriously as well so I, I think we played a part in in raising awareness of the you know the, the real challenges of this sort of using algorithms AI now in in situations where people are extremely vulnerable so you know the world has moved on since then this is uh 20 2019 you know, but but still I think the principles hold yeah no and it's 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 very important the um you know what you're saying there around you know technology because you know i'm a big advocate for technology for good but at times and with algorithms and with ai you know there is a whole host of you know ethical and moral and, and considerations that need to be addressed discussed and you know moving to to, to sensible and fair resolutions um, but we must stick with technology because it's a large part of your your dna and and, and you know your what you're passionate about as am i as a sort of in, in web3 and i'm involved in various technologies and i i'm I am all for tech for good. You play an active role in the technology space as the head of faculty for Legal Technology and Innovation Institute and the chair of Law Tech UK. Phenomenal roles. So since starting your career, what technological developments have you seen in the legal industry? And I'm sure because it was briefly mentioned there, we are going to talk about it once more as it's the word of the uh, the revolution, the decade, who knows? But t- tell us more. Yeah, so it's... Um... <laughs> I mean, I'm old enough that I can remember interviewing people uh, as you know, people who wanted to become trainee solicitors at my firm and saying to them in a very sort of wise way, I predict that one day we'll all have a computer on our desks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, this is way, way back in the dark ages where, when the people who were doing the typing them doing it on electronic typewriters and the fax machine had only just come in. So, you, you know, I've seen across my my long career an enormous technological revolution when it comes to, to law. And, you know, I, I think that, 
I think that the profession, and I, like you, I am a massive advocate of the use of technology. And I think that I spend a lot of time when I, in my representative roles and continue to do so, trying to convince the profession to wake up smell the coffee and adopt and adapt um, because I you know because it, it is impossible to think of um, a successful law firm in the mid-20s 2020s onwards not actually being completely run by technology and and you know and I think uh, and I, I said you know that's that's just literally round round the corner so you know I think I've seen that huge shifts uh and and some good adoption but you know most you know I'm not seeking to bash my my colleagues but I get, get a little exercised about this you know sometimes I think that if only if only solicitors knew how to use you know the Microsoft stack properly it'd be transformative hey <laughs> so it's all there it's all in there. actually at the you know the tips of our fingers so much great tech that we are we're not using it anywhere near optimally and which would be transformative of our daily lives actually so so I'm, I'm really keen for uh, the profession to to, to press into the opportunities, as I see the opportunities of utilising technology. I really believe that if we get it right, it will mean that people in law have better working lives. That's because they're, you know, they're not working stupid hours. They're doing really interesting things and they're really adding value. You know, what's not to like about that? So so I'm really, really passionate about this, you know, about getting the profession to accept that this is not going away and it's a good thing. Yeah, and plus one to to that, and you know, I was recently, um, you know, in Nashville for ClioCon, who who um, obviously very kindly Clio sponsor our show, and you know, they're big on firstly on client onboarding. You made a great point about um, Microsoft and even the iPhone. You know, self admission here. Probably I only know how to use ten percent of the functionality of an iPhone, or if you have a Samsung Android, you know, really understanding how these technologies can be leveraged to optimize performance efficiencies, and it plays a good part. You know, if I put my talent hat on, the recruiting, hat, you know, that will improve well being. You know, the, the hours work can be reduced. But I think a big thing about technology and what we're all passionate about, which it can help bridge the gap on, is access to justice if it's used in the right capacity. Time for a short break from the show. How do you fit your entire law firm into your pocket? By using Clio's legal software, that's how. Clio is the solution UK law firms choose to help them work more flexibly wherever they are. Because it works on any device, including a laptop, Mac, or mobile. You can carry Clio with you wherever you go. Record your time, manage documents, send client communications, and even keep colleagues updated when you're on the move. Whether you've got to do the school run, commuting to meet a client, working from home or the office or anywhere in between. Clio fits around how you want to work. Want to see how it all works? Check out clio.com forward slash legally speaking. That's C-L-I-O dot com forward slash legally speaking. Now back to the show. I know you're exceptionally passionate about championing diversity, inclusion, and access to justice. So what challenges are we currently facing within these areas and how can we overcome them? And, and do you believe with that statement that technology can indeed help bridge that gap? Yeah, 100%. So with Law Tech UK, which is the, the uh, Ministry of, of Justice body, which I chair, and I've chaired it from, from it the outset, and we've had two, two grants so far to uh, both two years and the first grant was all about business to business and growing UK based law tech business and exporting that internationally and making sure this is what Sir Geoffrey Voss is uh, holding on to here uh, he does almost all the work on, on this side of things making sure that the law of England and Wales is fit for purpose when it comes to emerging technologies, DLTs, etc., distributed ledger technologies like you know, crypto 
assets and currency. So so he does all that big brain stuff for us. <laughs> and then we also do, you know, we do a lot of support for the startups and scale ups. And we do um, a lot of support for law firms and other incumbents, as we think of them, to, to, to help them to adopt, to know what's out there and how they can use it and how it can make a difference for them. But in this second iteration, which we started May of this year, so we've still got 18 months to run on it, we, the panel, lobbied, and to be fair, the Ministry of Justice were very open to this, to have unmet legal need and addressing that as part of our key objectives. So we're really excited about that and and how we can now work closely uh, with particularly with third sector and not for profit. And we are actively doing that now to to work out what their problems are and how, at least in part, they can be solved through smart technology. So, so we, we've got a, um, a working group on this and we are also plugging not-for-profits and, and third sectors in, into our, um, our, our programmes of work. So we, we have programmes that, that um, you know, support ideation, support then the, the sort of, um, you know, a, a minimum viable product um, and then support the growth of that and then support mentoring. Um, and matchmaking, if you like, so that we're getting the right people, we're convening the right people in the room to be able to address these these issues. So I'm really excited. Um, we're at fairly early stages yet. I don't. I wouldn't say that we've solved it, but um, there is, a, you know, a, a good group of engaged people who who firmly believe, as I do, that we can come up with some some fabulous solutions to to be able to help and support those who are right on the you know on the front line of delivering access to justice and you know that that is is really exciting yeah no absolutely and you're, you're very much on that journey that's for sure but talking of right people in right places you have been appointed member of the king's council selection panel responsible for making recommendations for casey status to his majesty what recommendations have you made recently or which ones are you hoping to make if you can share in the future well, um, you know, being on the, the King's Council selection panel is, it, it is a, a, an immensely robust process for those who put themselves forward for the honour. And of course, it needs to be because it is the, the pinnacle of most lawyers' careers to be able to, to have that, um, set, I call it a badge, but you know, it's much more than that. It's a real <laughs> yeah. honour. <laughs> yeah, so so um, at, at, at the King's Council Selection Panel, we are um, there, there are only eleven of us on the panel um, at any time, um, and we go through an extremely rigorous process to be able to come up at the at the end of that with recommendations which go to His Majesty now, um, and um, at, at the moment they they are. Um, with him as we speak actually so so we've concluded this year's um this year's process uh and those people who um are uh, his majesty accepts the recommendations uh should hopefully know before or sometimes after christmas so so yes i'm sure they will be uh, uh anxiously <laughs> awaiting the electronic post to to see that we- <laughs> We concluded that we concluded this year's, and 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 we kick off again with the, the process in uh, in the following year. Exciting, and best of luck to those who have been involved in that process. Um, we must talk about your TEDx talk as well. The future is biased. You share in the UK in the law where women are more than fifty percent of practicing lawyers, but only thirty percent of partners, and even smaller number of business owners. How can those in the legal community be proactive in ensuring we are boosting the number of female partners and business owners? What actions must we take? Yeah. So um, 
I've only ever done one TEDx and I probably only ever will do because <laughs> it's a uniquely <laughs> terrifying thing to do. But um, and it's a wonderful thing to do if, you know, if any, any of your listeners are thinking of it. Um, but it is really hard. So you have to, I think my presentation is about 15 minutes and and you have to write it. And then you have to memorize it and you have to memorize it so well that it looks like it's just off the cuff. <laughs> and, uh, and I had to, I performed mine with no safety net. So you've got no notes or anything like that in front of, I think, a, a theater audience of about 1500 people. So it doesn't get much scarier than that, does it? But <laughs> and they're very dark, aren't they? They're very, very, very dark. The rooms. Oh my goodness. I know. I, I had my husband one of my daughters in the audience and I, I think they were they were verging on the heart attack because they were so frightened <laughs> for me. <laughs> but it it went okay and it's you know it's available on on YouTube but you know uh, the reason why I did it was because I felt really passionate about this subject which is you know, obviously about women in in positions of leadership particularly in in law but this tracks across almost all professions and it certainly tracks across all countries but also you know how the the utilization of technology could either hardwire all the bias and this is you know beyond um, gender bias all the bias that we we have in our societies into future decision making um, or how if we get it right, we could actually eradicate a lot of that bias, that you know, human bias out of future decision making. And, you know, that that I think is something that we need to to really as, you know, as citizens, we really just need to be aware of this ever more so in an increasingly AI world as to how how computers make decisions. <laughs> And, you know, and to be questioning, you know, a part of what I was saying in, in this TED talk was there's, there's a lot of research which evidence that people are really reluctant to say that the computer's got it wrong. And, you know, and, and that evidence actually came from the work that I was talking about before from the commission where, you know, the, the, the many of the police officers uh, were saying that, yeah, they knew this decision didn't feel you know right in their gut, but the computer had come up with it, so it, it must be right. A, B, they'd have to do a hell of a lot of paperwork go <laughs> <laughs> yeah. against the computer decision. So you know that becomes really problematic in a world where so many things that are of fundamental importance to us are the decisions have been made. Um, by algorithms and um, you know and we we really do need I think to be um, active questioners you know, um, and and to ensure that 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 is good for us and good for society and brings about you know more um, equity in, in in our world rather than less yeah, really well said. I, I always say you have to have the curiosity gene. You know, you really do need to be curious to this and, and inquisitive. And, you know, not everything that is like you say, this output, particularly when people are using a lot of AI tools today. And we've seen various cases with, with lawyers using it and, you know, made up cases and so forth and everything else and, and fact check everything. Right. And actually go back and, and, and make those steps to ensure that within your heart and hearts, this decision, because some of these decisions are huge and have real bearings on people's livelihoods, careers, you name it. So I think you make a really good point on, on that. And, and Christina, earlier this year, and it was no surprise to me that you were awarded an honorary fellowship from Exeter College, Oxford. How did you feel about achieving yet another amazing achievement? Oh, well, thank you, uh, Rob. I, I, I was really chuffed. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a, it's, um, I, I went to, that's where I did my undergraduate degree. Um, and I've, you know, over the years, I've done quite a lot of work um with the with the college and the university particularly around diversity and inclusion um and so when i when i got uh, the letter that said that they had elected me um 
you know, you know there's, they've got some amazing people who are, who are honorary fellows. I, I was I was so um, moved actually. It was you know just it was it was a lovely a lovely thing. And you know now now I'm doing some some really interesting work supporting them um, in relation to diversity and inclusion as as well. So you know it's. Um, I hope I, I hope I'm going to be able to give back some some value. Oh, I'm sure you will, and you've given us some serious value today. But before we let you go, we have one final question, and that is: What advice would you give to those starting their career in the legal profession? Oh, okay. Um, so I think first of all, be intentional. Yeah, have have a plan. No, it, you know, it doesn't need to be your your ten year master take over the universe plan, but you know, uh, just have a plan about where you want to go and what, and and know your why in that, why you want to do it. If if you follow things that are you are passionate about, you can't really go wrong. But I think it's quite hard, particularly when you're young, to 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 live with that sort of intentionality and you don't feel perhaps that you've got m- too much autonomy in in relation to your life but but I would say you do you know I'd say feel your power <laughs> um and and get people around you who are there who can sort of be like your board you know not not all just rah rah supporters but people who are going to be critical friends who are going to hold you accountable to you know, to, to delivering on what you say you want to do, and um, you know that you'll probably leap ahead you know, year, by years if if you can actually um, implement that and stick to it and you know be accountable for it. If I was to answer the question, I would 100% agree with what you've just said there. I would strongly encourage, if you've enjoyed this episode as much as I have, please go back and just rewind that little snippet because it's so important. It speaks to so many things that I talk about that really are important. You know, I always think of the analogy, which I picked up one of my friends from the legal community, for me, for you. A lot of your people that you know may not necessarily be in that board of directors that you say you advise as critical friends. I love how you frame that. You know, if it's for, for you, I means someone might tell you to do something. But that, if that isn't for you, that isn't your why, your passion, don't go and be the lawyer because someone says, that's a for you. Do something that's for me and do that internal work. Ask those questions. Really think about you know where you want to take that career and be, I always say, ferociously focused, right, in terms of where you want to take things and, and really be dedicated to it. And you make a great point about the network and the people who surround you and actually really inspire you, challenge you and push you down the, the route that's right for you. Um, so thank you ever so much, Christina. This has been an absolute blast, as I knew it would be. And if our listeners want more, which I'm sure they will, where can they learn more about your time as the president of the Law Society? You touched on your TEDx, you know, Black Laws Consulting. What's the best way for them to contact you? Feel free to shout out any social media handles or website links. We'll also share them with this episode for you too. Oh, thanks, Rob. And it's been really, really lovely. I think probably the best place is either through LinkedIn. LinkedIn has all my contact um details there and uh and i have a website as well which if you just google christina blacklaws that will come up i hope (laughs) it certainly will you're very findable because you're doing so many amazing things so from all of us on the legally speaking podcast thank you so so much once again christina it's been an absolute pleasure wishing you lots of continued success with all of your pursuits uh but for now from all of us on the show over and out Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like the content here, why not check out our world-leading content and collaboration hub, the Legally Speaking Club, over on Discord. Go to our website, www.legallyspeakingpodcast.com for the link to join our community there. Over and out.